continue today. Um, this message was actually born out of a Wednesday night discussion that we had. Um, if, if you guys haven't been coming on Wednesday nights, you, you should really try at least to make some of them. Um, we've been having some really, really good discussions, some really good insights, and, uh, and, and so this one's going to come from a discussion that we had, and, and, uh, and, and I'd like to share it with you because every one of them told me that's what I needed to do. This actually come from, I think, three or maybe three or four Wednesdays ago. Um, and for you Wednesday night crew, it's good. We need to hear it again anyway because it, it's, it's good. Um, if, you, if you brought your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 11, um, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 2. This has kind of been our anchor verse for our series that we've been doing on shame. Um, and, and we're going to read it again and just kind of use this as a launching point. I got a few scriptures I want us to read, but, um, or at least reference, depending on how we're doing for time. Um, this has been our anchor verse here for, the, for, for our study of shame we've been doing. And, and, and if you remember... Shame is one of those things that um, Jesus took on the cross for us. There's several Bible verses that explicitly state that outright. You don't have to infer it. You don't have to try to extrapolate it. It, 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 it explicitly states it outright that Jesus bore our shame for us. Um, this is a part of our identity. 11-2. So this is a this is a part of our identity as brothers and sisters in Christ, as as sons and daughters of God, as a, with a seat at His table. Is shame is never meant to be our portion. We're never meant to have shame in our life, unrepentant shame. Now, 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 make no mistake. We certainly will wrestle with the emotion of shame as it comes, and if we allow it to cause repentance, we let it go and move on, never to revisit the emotion again. But unrepentant shame, living a lifestyle of shame in our life is never our portion, right? It's never who we are, because it, it, it quite simply stated, who Jesus is, is who we are. He is the expressed image of God, the love of God made manifest for man. He created us in our image, a totally transformed, renewed mind does what? Demonstrates the kingdom. It proves that good, acceptable, and perfect will of the Lord. Now, some of your translations in Romans 12 too will say approve. Um, it, this actually means proof like whiskey. How many know if you buy a bottle of whiskey, it's, I don't know how much proof it is, but somewhere around 90 proof, right? If you buy a bottle of whiskey, right? Well, that was, that, that measurement was actually useful in older days where you could buy a, a, an alcohol and really not, you had to trust the person you were buying it from as to its strength. And so what they would do is they would take some and light it on fire. And if it, then it proved that it was alcohol. You proved that it was alcohol. So an unrenewed or a renewed mind, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of the Lord. So in other words, we're flashpoints around this world that demonstrate the kingdom of God. We approve, just like the proof of whiskey, if you light it on fire, it blows up. You light us on fire, we blow up for the gospel. We prove the will of God to the world around us by the lives we live, by the life we live, right? So shame is the number one way in which Satan robs us of our ability to prove God's will. Because if we're ashamed of ourselves and who we are, we'll never allow ourselves to be lit on fire. The moment that fire starts to burn, we put it out. How many people do you guys know? How many believers do you know that get saved 
and they're really on fire, but then it doesn't take very long. That fire has diminished and it's just not there anymore. I'll submit to you today that almost 100% of the time it's because there's unrepentant shame they've not dealt with. And I'm not putting the blame, I'm not saying this condemningly. I'm, I'm just saying as a matter of fact that as mature believers, when we have new converts or people in our midst that aren't mature believers, we need to help them deal with their shame that they have that Jesus already paid the price for, but yet the enemy's telling them working overtime, keep on, you, you're, you're, you, know, you're, you need to be ashamed, who are you, blah, 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 right? And we're not in their other ear saying, Jesus died for your shame, Jesus died for your shame, you don't have to be ashamed. So as mature believers, we... Play a, we should play a very important role in keeping immature believers on fire for the gospel, right? All right, so Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Let's read that again. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with, humble, well, with the humble is wisdom. Today I want to look at the root cause of shame, which is pride. It says it right here. Then I want to look at what is pride and contrast what is humility. But listen, I don't want us to get caught up on... All right, so here's the deal. I'm just going to say this plain. We all think, and I'm saying me until I did the study, well, we, we know what pride is. We all know what that is. Preacher, go, come on. Just don't slow walk us to this. We know what pride is. I'm, I'm going to say you know what the world says pride is, but I'm going to venture a guess to say that you probably don't know a biblical definition or a perspective on pride. And what we want to do is see things the way God sees them. I don't care how the world tutors me. I want to know what God says. And I want to see things the way he sees it. And I'm going to tell you there's, there's, there's some difference, okay? Um, quite simply, shame is merely a consequence of pride. Shame is a consequence of pride. In other words, if there's shame here in your life, then at some point in the past there was pride. Pr shame cannot exist without pride. Because pride is always con always concerned about others, what, but not in a good way. What others think, others' opinions. I mean, think about it. You're ashamed. Why? I don't want anybody to find out, <laughs> right? Or if someone has found out, oh, what do they think of me? I just can't show my face, right? That's shame. Shame is a consequence of pride. First pride, then shame. It says it here. When pride comes, then after the pride, you get shame. Shame is a consequence of pride. But with the humble, you get what? Wisdom. In 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 6, Peter tells us about submitting ourselves to the Lord and being humble. And then in the very next verse, Peter talks about resisting the devil and he will flee to you, flee from you, right? Is it a coincidence that Peter wrote, humility, resist the devil? Is being humble a, a way of resisting the devil? In fact, I would say humility is the way to resist the devil but we have to have a good viewpoint of what humility is, a biblical understanding, because it's not what we think. Something totally different, at least from what I thought. Um, our, our, our next verse is still in Proverbs. We're going to stay in Proverbs. It's 16, verse 18, and we all know it. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. You ever heard that saying, pride goeth before a fall? Well, that's actually not a correct 
quotation of the Bible verse, pride goes before destruction and a prideful spirit before fall. I'll say this, I'm, I'm not going to slow walk you because I've got, I'm, I'm just going to say it outright. There is no destruction, there is no falling without pride. Now that's a proverb that's not very well accepted because pride is celebrated in our culture. Pride is just celebrated in our culture. You can look at it in our, in our media. You can look at it in our, our, our singers, our artists, our actors, our politicians. Um, we celebrate pridefulness. We, and come on, think about it. The American dream, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make a living for yourself, is kind of prideful. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and through hard work you make a good life for yourself. I think that's biblical. But American culture almost celebrates the fact that you did it alone when for a believer we do nothing alone. We do it through God. And our founding fathers understood this and knew that a country could never exist and be successful and, and, and enjoy prosperity the way America has enjoyed it without the blessing of God. They understood that. In our more enlightened age, we don't have room for God. Right? It's just us. We, we do. That was supposed to be facetious. If, okay. All right. Got to be careful. I'll get quoted on Twitter by saying, Pastor says, anyway. Um, Destruction and falling is a result of pride. It is merely a result of pride. If you stop pride, you'll stop destruction. How many of you have ever felt, don't raise your hand, but just answer to yourself. How many of you have ever been this way or know people this way that they seem like they can never get ahead? They're always playing catch up. They live in a consistent state of poverty. And I don't mean just finances. Poverty exists beyond finances. There's people that have very wealthy that are, that are poor. It's not really about money. That, that's what we have to understand in, in our country today is poverty is not about money. Poverty is a spiritual attitude and attack that is generational in nature. And... You can give a poor person a million bucks, they're still going to be poor because they're not going to have it for very long. Why? Because it's not about money. I, I can make $50,000 a year and be rich. Somebody else can make $150,000 a year and have to live in the woods. It's, it's not about money. That's another message for another day, the spirit of poverty, because that's something we could use some teaching on. Um, if you stop pride, you'll stop the destruction. We know people, we may be one themselves. I was one in my past that sometimes I was just always behind. I always felt like everything was against me. Everything I touched just turned it was my perception. It wasn't reality. But pride is the source of all of that, not someone else. None of us in this room are victims. We've been made more than victims. Victim mentality is merely another form of shame that, is, that, is, that has been created to keep us from being productive. Well, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know what she said to me. Let that garbage go because it's not their problem. The reason you're struggling with it is not because of them. It's you. 99% of the battles we'll ever fight as Christians are between the ears, not out here, not through interpersonal relationships. It's between here. But you don't know how they hurt me because of what they said to me. That's your problem, not theirs. Anger only comes by pride. That happens to be Proverbs 
that says only by pride comes contention. It doesn't say some pride comes by contention. Only by pride comes contention. If you have a relationship that's contentious, guess what? Somewhere in that relationship is pride. And if you're the hurt one, I don't mean to be so strong, and, and, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm trying to set you free. If you can get rid of the pride, you'll get rid of the destruction. It's not a condemning word. This is a word that says, hey, here's how, you, here's how you move on. Here's how you get free. Move past the pride. Get rid of the pride. You'll move past the destruction. It's what's inside of us that makes us angry, not what other people do to, not what other people do to us. Did you know that? Because it's only by pride that comes anger and, and contention and strife. It's only by pride. I could use this on the interstate. I loathe 18 wheelers. Like, I loathe them. Like, I believe they should have their own highway system that nobody else can travel on but 18 wheelers. And they can go as fast or as slow as they want to. I don't care. They're dangerous and Go away, soapbox, because um, it's probably not going to happen. But the roads are just too crowded. So Friday, I'm on my way to Florida to go diving, and people are just really making me angry. They're uh, right. They're pulling out in front of me. They're going slow. I have to push the brake and turn off my cruise control. Or I have to push the gas to get around them and then have to get in the back in the right lane and then let my cruise control take back over. Or they're driving in the left lane and they need to be driving in the right lane and they're making me late. They're annoying me and causing me inconvenience. Um, do you see how that's pride? What was a common word in that? Me. Me, me, ah, 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 ah. Me, 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 ah, ah, ah. In fact, that's a biblical definition of pride. When it's all about me, I'm in pride. But see, we've been taught that pride only means narcissism or arrogance, right? Well, if I'm arrogant, that means I'm real prideful. But what if I come over here and say, well, but, you know, I'm just not good enough to do that. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm too shy. I, I, can't, I can't do, I can't help with VBS and get up here and dance. I'm too shy. I can't do that. I'm not good enough either. I, that's pride too. Why? Because it's making it all about me and telling me why I can't. That's pride. So on this side over here, you've got... Pride is arrogance. Arrogance is definitely pride. We're all pretty familiar with that, right? But do you know that shy people are some of the most prideful people in the world? Do you know that people that, that have fear, that are very fearful, are some of the most prideful people in the world? Timid? Afraid to try new things? are some of the most prideful people in the world? Why? Because it's about me. Me, 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 me. I can't do, I can't do, I'm not good enough to do, I, I, me, me. If you remember in, 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 in Exodus, when Moses was confronted with the burning bush, you remember that? God told Moses, hey, I'm going to use you to set my people free. Go to Pharaoh and tell him to let them go. And Moses is like, whoa, time out, boss. <laughs> Have you heard me talk? Most scholars do believe that Moses stuttered. Have you heard me talk? I can't do that. Number one, 
I, that's number one issue. I can't talk well enough. Number two is uh, he's going to kill me. <laughs> I can't just go to Pharaoh. Don't you? Well, and number three, I, there's probably still a warrant for my arrest for murder. Don't you remember that? Because I killed a guard. Um, that's why I'm here in the desert in the first place. No, I can't do that. And they had this long conversation, right? Do you know Moses was operating in pride? He was extremely prideful because he was telling God why he couldn't do it. I can't do this, God, because of this, that, whatever. And that's pride. Why? Because Moses made it about his shortcomings, not about who God is. See how tough that is? You see how easy debasing yourself and low self-esteem is merely another form of pride? Yeah, right? See, Satan's tricky. And you have to understand his end goal. His end goal is to make you ineffective for the kingdom. His goal is to keep you like you are. He doesn't want you to grow and he doesn't want you to change. He can either do that by arrogance to try to convince you you don't need to change or he can convince you by telling you you're not worth changing or you don't have the strength or, strength or the ability when in fact it was never up to you to begin with. All you have to do is trust God. Like you could change yourself if you if, anyway. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. All we have to do is believe God. That's why it's so important to know who you are. To know your identity. Shame's never been your portion. Pride was the original sin. Satan, or Lucifer, wanted to be like God and wanted to exalt himself beyond God. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you this, the most the, the biggest threat, I'm gonna, this is going to make some of you mad, but let me finish. This is the, the, the biggest threat to the American church or the Western church today is not sexual perversion. It's not thievery or stealing. It's pride. Because if you can destroy the pride, then you'll never have to deal with the rest of what I just mentioned. All of this business that we're fussing about the left and the right in our church it's not about the issue it's about pride that's all it is because it's well i think well i believe here's the word that this doesn't change it's not about what i want it's not about what i think is right about what God says. In fact, the easiest road is just to let everybody in and not have any confrontation. That's the easiest road. Come on, it is. But sometimes you have to stand up and fight and say no. Well, you're going to get persecuted. Praise God. He says, I'm blessed when I get persecuted, but I have to be free of pride to endure persecution because they're going to attack my identity. And if I don't know who I am, then I'm going to get destroyed because pride always goes before fall. You see how that works? If it's about me, I'm going to fail. But if I can make it about him, then I'll never fail because love never does. It's really that simple. It's, it, it's not rocket science. It's just we've had the wool pulled over our eyes and told us by religious folks, that being arrogant is prideful, but debasing yourself and thinking yourself so low and so worthless, that's being, that's being humble. And that's not humble either. That's just another form of pride. Well, what is humility? Because I thought being lowly and, and thinking myself unworthy of everything was humility, right? That's kind of what we're taught. That's just another form of pride. Remember, we used Moses as, a, as an example of um, pride when he argued with God about, hey, 
I'm not good enough to go to Pharaoh. You need to get somebody else that's better than me. We use that as pride. Well, Moses actually has another great example of humility. Um, in Numbers chapter 12, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. It's a perfect example of humility. Get this. Now the man Moses was very meek. I'm the meekest person on earth. In fact, I invented meekness. I'm going to take meekness to a whole other level. I'm going to be so meek. Is that meekness? Because that's what it says. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Not only am I meek, but I'm better and above every other person on the face of this earth. If I got up here and preached that to you about me, how many of y'all would be here by the time I got done? None of you, right? Guess who wrote this? Moses? Moses wrote this about himself. I'm the meekest person on the earth and I'm above everybody else on the earth. It is a perfect example of humility. Because if he just said to God, when God told him to write this, if he just said, God, I can't write that, do you know what people are going to think of me? That would have been pride. Why? Because it's inward focused. If he wrote that, and maybe his editor would say, Oh, you can't put that in there. Do you know what people are going to say about you? It's not about me. It's about him. He told me to write it. If persecution comes, so be it. He'll help me endure it. But I will not change his word. That's humility. Humility is none of me, all of him. See, the center of the core of the gospel was not fill out this card give your 10% and come to church. That's not the center of the gospel. The center of the gospel is what Jesus said in red letters. He said, if you, anybody wishes to follow me, let him first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. That's the core of the gospel. And so in order for me to deny myself, I first have to be humble, which says, not my way, but yours. Simply stated, I'm yours. The good, the bad, the ugly, I'm yours. All of it. I'm going to do it your way, not mine. I'm going to say what you want me to say. If you tell me to tell everyone that I'm the example to follow, then that's what I'll do. Well, you know how much persecution you're going to get? Blessed am I when I get persecuted. As long as I'm sure I'm saying what you're telling me to say. So whether you want me to be whether you want me to live a life of everyone looking at me thinking I'm awesome or whether you want me to live a life of behind the scenes and nobody knows my name, I don't care as long as I'm following you. That's humility. So you can't look at somebody who's on stage with 10,000 people looking at him and following his, his or her teaching and, well, they're prideful. They're, they're just prideful because, look at that, a, a real humble person wouldn't have all that. No, maybe that's his lot in life. Maybe that's what God's called him to do, and the very fact you're saying that about him is the persecution he has to endure. Well, what if you come to a little church and you got this awesome worship leader who should be cutting albums and, and, and should be on Caleb every other song and should be doing wondrous things, but he or she is stuck quote unquote, in this church. And that says, it's not about me. This is where God wants me. He told me to be here and I'm not leaving until he tells me to leave. But nobody's going to discover you here. I've already been discovered. <laughs> by who, who else do, do I care to be discovered by? Yeah, but do you know how much money you make? You, you could make if you... Then see how it's trying to change the focus to you? That's pride. Humility says, I don't care. Paul said, I've learned to have a lot. I've learned to have a little. 
but in all things I'm content. It's humility. I can be I can be here when I have a lot. I can also be here when I have nothing. Because the stuff's not what sustains me. He does. And he never changes. So no matter what situation I'm in, I'm okay. So this is that's how you demonstrate the kingdom. In case you didn't know, that's where I'm going with this. That's how you demonstrate the kingdom. Okay, let me explain, let me explain it. The kingdom of God is not an absence of trouble. We're going to go through the same stuff unbelievers go through. We're just going to. What makes us different is we can proclaim his goodness when our circumstances are violating his goodness. Do you understand? We can, we can endure and maintain purity and holiness and a right spirit and still praise him in the midst of loss, in the midst of, of, of tragedy and chaos. We can still have those. We can still be with a smile on our face. Not, I'm not denying the pain. I'm not divine, denying that it hurts. Sure, it hurts, but you just have a different source of strength than anyone else. He's your source of strength, and it'll never run out. In fact, Paul said, I'm going to boast in my weakness, because when I'm weak, he's strong. So it's better for me to be weak, because he's strong, because it's never about me. It's always about him. Y'all getting any of this? But if I, if I get, if I have a, let, let, let's say me and Mr. Jerry right here, he's an unbeliever, I'm a believer, all right? And we have the same exact tragedy that hits us in our life at the exact same time. And he's crying and hollering and his life is over. And if I'm doing the same thing and then out of my next breath says, you know, you really ought to come to my church. Why? <laughs> You're not doing any better than I'm doing. Why do I want that Jesus? Well, I don't blame him. I wouldn't want that Jesus either. And I just thank the Lord that he introduced me to people that demonstrated the real Jesus. So if we're going through the same thing and he's hollering and complaining and, and, and just totally wrecked, life's over, and I'm sitting here with a smile on my face and God, I thank you that you're so good. And Lord, I thank you for your provision. Father, I thank you for your healing. Lord, your, 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 your hand's always on me. I never have to worry. And I'm just continuing with life, and he's freaking out, and he's he's going, he's going to come beat me down to find out what's going on. I don't ever have to invite him. He's going to come invite himself. You see how that works? But that's the core of the gospel. He's operating in pride. I'm operating in humility. Lord, even if I have to go through this trial and suffering, let me demonstrate your kingdom in the midst of it. Because I'm only a traveler in this world. This is not my permanent destination. I, I, I represent another kingdom, another way of life, another way of doing things. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? Do you see how shame can rob you of that opportunity? Do you see how shame is merely a consequence of pride? And how pride can so easily creep in, you don't even know it. The moment you make anything... And look, I'm not trying to set up a set of rules that puts, us, puts a burden on us that we can't fulfill. I'm not trying to do that, and I don't think I am. All I'm, all I'm doing is saying, just maintain a conversation with him at all times. Just, 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 just know him, and in the knowing him, pride will begin to be destroyed in your life. You'll, you will begin to change. Just know him. Know what his word says. Know him. And pride will begin to start. Think of it this way. And I'm going to close with this. Think of it this way. Pride. Nope. Think of it. Humility is an impenetrable wall that surrounds you that Satan can't get through. He can't penetrate. Pride is the tearing down of that wall that gives him free access to attack you whenever he wants. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. How? Humility. 
because it's never about me anyway. See, if you can, if you can look Satan in the eye, so to speak, and, and, and genuinely mean this, it doesn't matter if I'm suffering or if I'm in, on the top of the mountain. It doesn't matter. It's not about me. It's about him. He kind of starts leaving you alone. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to attack this guy. He's just going to praise God. That's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. I'm going to go find somebody else that don't know who they are. And then you can start walking in authority. See, some of you have been asking me, Jeff, I want to see more. I want to be able to walk in authority. Okay, here's a key. Get rid of pride. Walk in humility. He can't touch you anymore. Now you're starting to walk in authority because there's no fear. There's no self-centeredness. And now you can start taking authority over people's lives where, he's, where Satan's attacking them. And you can take authority and say, no. No. Oh, that's that guy that knows who he is. We better get out of here. He'll spread that if we stay. I really believe that's the key. Y'all okay? <clears throat> Simply, just know him. Just know him. There's no condemnation in this word. There's freedom in it. There's freedom in it. Just know him and you'll be free. You'll be free of others. You'll be free of yourself. Just know him. Amen. Same power.